The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the third chapter. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing, winnowing fork is now in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Be seated, please. For many, I think, January is a time of personal assessment. We face the new year with goals and aspirations that require, I think, a certain degree of honesty with ourselves. And as we celebrate the baptism of our Lord today, the church makes a deliberate effort to take an honest look at itself, to confess that despite the meager achievements and certainly our good intentions, we as human beings remain sinful. In other words, things are not okay. And if we're honest, we have to admit our need of God's forgiveness. Some years ago, the Wall Street Journal uh, published one of its more provocative editorials that began with this question. When was the last time you had a good conversation about sin. Anybody done that recently? Probably not. The editorial recounted the roll call of moral dilemmas appearing daily on television, including corruption, immorality, addiction, and so forth. And that was just the commercials. We gotta turn up the joke meter here, you know. <laughs> All right. The author then made this observation. Sin isn't something that, that many people, including most churches today, have spent much time talking about or worrying about through the years. But we will say this for sin. It at least offered a frame of reference for personal behavior. When the frame was dismantled, guilt wasn't the only thing that fell away. We also lost the guide wire of personal responsibility. That editorial, I believe, gives voice to a great void in our lives. Namely, that a healthy, honest look of sin is very hard to come by these days. In his book, The Wisdom of the Ego, psychiatrist George Valent describes our complex system of defense mechanisms by which we protect ourselves from the devastating onslaughts of reality. And here's what he says, far from being negative, our defenses, these wonderfully idiosyncratic means by which the brain devises to shield us from the cold facts about ourselves, are positive coping, coping mechanisms. So don't expect too much raw honesty from me about my sin. I am well defended. Dr. Valent believes that we become more adept in utilizing our defense mechanisms as we get older, and thus providing more elaborate and sophisticated rationalizations for our sin. And that's not just individually, it's society as well. It was uh, Blaise Pascal who once said, if everyone knew the innermost thoughts of everyone else, there wouldn't be five friends left on earth. No wonder we work so hard to shield ourselves from one another, those defense mechanisms again. And it was Carl Jung who said, the darker the shadow inside, 
the more polished the mask we must wear. There's a very high cost involved for polishing our masks, concealing our sin, and perhaps even our identity crisis. What then can we do about this identity crisis? The Christian church has always responded with this firm answer. We can repent. And so our claim is that God gives us the resources to be honest. And that requires the help of God. Lord, have mercy, we pray. And God does have mercy, and thus we can be honest. We don't have to go on polishing our masks because God sees who's beneath the mask hiding there. And there's no need to smooth over our past because God knows our checkered history through and through and then promises to redeem it all. Can we be honest that the cause of human suffering is sin? I think there's hardly any word out there today that is so poorly understood. And perhaps it's because we tend to think of sin in moralistic terms as the lack of virtue. But as Soren Kierkegaard pointed out, the opposite of sin is not virtue, but rather faith. So we might do better, I think, to connect sin with our failure to trust God, which then leads, of course, to our failure to love. If you want to engage yourself in a profoundly sobering thought, imagine for a moment the extent of suffering in our world today caused simply by our refusal to love. We often tend, I think, to privatize sin, thinking of it primarily as the dark thoughts and deeds of individuals. And yet the Bible's prophetic tradition is much more vocal of corporate or communal sin than it is of individual sin. Corporate sin is manifested in the deliberate abuse of power, namely attempting to bring others under our control. And thus, because we're used to that demonstration of power, a lot of people think this is how God is supposed to operate as well. That God is supposed to use God's power then to heal my illness, solve my financial crisis, make my child successful, prove me right against all my critics, and then zap the evil forces that are causing me pain and discomfort. God should just use his power and make all those things happen. But here's where we run into trouble. There are lots of situations where power alone cannot help us. Who can zap the destructive habits of a spouse or a child captive to drugs or alcohol? Who can apply the right amount of force to bring about affection when there's nothing but resentment or forgiveness where there's so much raw hurt? The Christian faith doesn't deny God's power, but we are called to lean on what we understand as the logic of the cross. That is, God does not resolve our pain by sheer might, by sheer coercion in our lives. If sin is at the root of most suffering, then power alone will not change things. If lovelessness is the problem, then love is the answer. If abuse of power is the problem, then humility is the answer. That is what our baptism into Christ is all about. God loving us so much that God enters into each of our personal struggles. And it's that power which addresses the real identity crisis in our lives. And then that promise alone which frees us for lives of honesty, compassion, and love. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that on this day in which we celebrate your baptism, we likewise find ourselves baptized into your death, your resurrection, and your promise of eternal life. Lord, help us to recognize with great honesty today that we are a people of a sinful nature, and that the only thing that releases us from that sin is your grace, your forgiveness, your love in our lives. 
May that power, the power of the cross, free us to likewise love and serve as you love us. In your name we pray. Amen.